All right, hi everybody. Uh, we wanted to take some time here to walk you through the application for the Certificate of Inclusion into the Monarch CCAA. Um, we've had a number of applicants already and others that are still enrolling. And so we wanted to take some time to walk through the application piece by piece so everybody can be aware of the content and details that are needed throughout each section. Okay, so we have the application form here. Uh, we have it organized into several sections. Uh, the first one being providing your information. Then we ask you to describe the conditions on which you're sort of enrolling the, the CCAA. We have the agreement to participate, which is uh, c confirming that you're uh, committing to all the aspects of the CCAA itself. And then we ask you to calculate your adopted acres contribution, what con note which conservation measures you'll be using, and then we have some um, associated sort of reference information for definitions, uh, conservation measures, as well as a copy of the Certificate of Inclusion itself. So to start from the top, if we walk you through this, um, as a reminder, we have a note here on what you need to complete your application package. So that includes not only this application form, but also supporting maps and documentation that are needed to help review that and understand, again, the context and the extent of enrolled lands that you're including in the agreement. There's also the Section 7 analysis supporting documentation, which we will be doing a uh, separate tutorial on um, to talk about details there. So be sure to check that out if um, you're interested in learning more about that appendix. And then also um, any other supplemental information that you need to support your application. And so that could be um, additional supporting maps or reports or other information that you feel helps describe what you're committing to and aspects of your, um, of your application. Once done, that gets returned to the um, Monarch Agreement Program Administrator at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And so the contact information and everything is there. Submitting it via email is perfectly fine. And then once your application is reviewed, the administrator will, will return the signed copy of your certificate of inclusion and um, then request payment for the first year's administrative fee. So um, some good background and uh, procedural information there on the first page. So then what do you have to provide information wise? On the first, on the next page then we have the applicant information. Uh, this includes your organization name, the primary point of contact, so whoever's uh, largely completing the application and will act as the primary point person for your organization as you move on into implementation of the CCAA, as well as the authorizing signature name and contact. So the CCAA itself does not specify what level of authority uh, or type of signature is needed for that authorizing signature. So that's going to be specific to your organization on um, identifying what individual is appropriate to sign into an agreement like this, which essentially provides a, a permit authorization you know, uh, system-wide for the lands that you're enrolling. Below that, we have this checkbox for noting whether or not you have uh, confidential or sensitive business information within the application itself. This is a flag for UIC to, to see what information they um, you know, want to keep confidential, you know, uh, respecting those confidentiality needs that um, some businesses have and um, make sure that as we're sharing information with the service or, you know, with requests that those are um, kept sensitive and confidential. Below that checkbox, there's also a space where you can actually describe what pieces of the application you consider to be confidential. Of course, it's a good practice. It's always a good idea to note on those pieces of information you know, in an obvious way, big red bold letters, you know, confidential, so it's it's clear. Okay, then, so moving on to the description of existing conditions. At the top, we ask you via a series of drop-down menus to select the type of operations that are being enrolled. So as you click on those, there's drop-downs that occur for the different sectors that are included within the CCAA that have the adoption rates tied to those. So depending on the type of system that you're enrolling, you might have just one. 
um, you might have several. So uh, select those as appropriate, and that just helps UIC and Fish and Wildlife Service to understand, um, again, broadly the context that you're operating within and which adoption rates apply. Okay, and then next we ask for a short summary of the system of lands that you're enrolling. And so, as we note here, we want the location and estimated acreage of the enrolled lands, so the lands on which you're seeking to have incidental take coverage. Uh, and then we want to know what's the management ability of your organization on those lands. So is it owned, is it easement lands, or leased, or some other um, applicable land management um, you know, scenario where you can sort of manage vegetation and uh, uh, conduct operations. And Dan, if I could add just quick, um, also in that section, it's good to specifically identify if there's any lands that you're not including. Um, either you know they're not included in the land area that you would like um, covered or the incidental take coverage or you otherwise you know for for whatever reason have chosen not to include um, in the, the enrolled lands for the CCIA. Great excellent point Iris yes so the description of enrolled lands is the description of the extent of where you have incidental take coverage so it's important to describe what that is as well as what that does not include and so, um, yes, make sure that clarification is there. Thank you. Right, and then um, on the next section, we ask you to summarize the covered activities that you're including with your enrollment. If you wish to just include all the covered activities that are included within section five of the agreement of the CCAA, you can just point to that and note that. And again, that section broadly describes a variety of operations and maintenance activities that occur on energy and transportation lands. And so um, if you want that broad coverage to all those activities, you can. Um, some partners may wish to enroll, at least initially, only a subset act of activities. And um, if that's the case, you can detail what those are here. In this next section, then, we want to get, again, a brief summary of the monarch habitat availability and the conservation measures that you envision implementing on the ground. And so in this section, we're looking for, at a high level, where does monarch habitat potentially occur? Um, and what are the types of activities you can do to, to promote conservation on those lands, on those adopted acres? And how will that be sort of implemented through the agreement? So again, this section in particular helps sort of paint the vision or the picture for the service as well as UIC and understanding the, the net conservation benefit that's provided by your enrollment and what that looks like. Next in section E, we ask for a map or you could have some GIS files that show the extent or the location of the enrolled lands. And so again, thinking that the CCAA is transmitting incidental take coverage to these enrolled lands, we want to be clear on where those lands uh, occur or where they don't occur. And so having lands at a scale that make that clear is really important. There's no set defined scale or uh, specific requirements for maps. Uh, we don't expect necessarily to have you know, individual parcel maps for each location, but we also need something with a little bit more detail than maybe a, a, you know, a broad series of lines on a map. Uh, we're hoping to have enough detail combined with the narrative description that you provided earlier in, this, in the application to really have a clear picture of where those enrolled lands occur and where they don't occur. I should say the map also can be very uh, adaptable in its format. I know some applicants already have provided a series of PDF maps. Others have uh, provided links to online maps that they may maintain that show enrolled lands. And um, others have provided either the uh, you know, shape files or, or you know, feature classes in the form of GIS files or KMZ files that can be used for Google Earth and those types of applications. So really the, the, the mapping can provide a, a range as long as it provides that information. Again, that helps us clearly understand where your enrolled lands are. Okay, then next we ask for a summary of the constraints that affect your ability to implement conservation on those lands. So when you think about your adopted acres and your conservation measures that you are implementing, there's often constraints that face um, any operation. 
It might be the fact that you have easements. Um, and so your easements individually only allow you their local uh, or state laws that prohibit certain types of activities related to your organization or your operations. And so those may in some way inhibit or limit what you can and can't do as it relates to conservation measures in the CCAA. Those types of things are worth noting as well. There might be others as well. Those are just a few examples that we um, commonly hear or see. And so again, think about what's specific to your context. And this helps again, UIC and the service to understand the context within which you are working and through the capabilities that are, uh, it'll be provided through the CCAA. Okay, and then in these last two components of this section, we get into um, how the CCAA and your application specifically relate to um, the uh, you know, taking of other federal species. So one condition of the CCAA is that we are um, um, not jeopardizing any other listed species, federal listed species. And so to that, we want to know under Section G, if you have other agreements, permits, authorizations that provide and still take coverage for other listed species, we'd like to have that listed here. Um, those could be habitat conservation plans, so they still take permits. But um, you know, anything that provides your organization and still take coverage for other listed species, we'd like to have summarized here. You know, simple list or a table is, is fine. Um, again, the, the assumption with the CCA is that most operations are avoiding take of listed species. And so if, if you have exemptions for that or allowances for that through other permits, we want that summarized here. Then under section H, we specifically ask you in an attachment to address um, other section seven considerations and specifically those that um, include covered activities and potential impacts on current or proposed federal listed plant species, as well as proposed or designated critical habitats. And this was one condition within the uh, you know, permit authorization, as well as the conference opinion prepared for the CCAA, that we consider specifically those listed plants and critical habitats because they might not have another regulatory uh, trigger, as it were, outside of the CCAA. And so to make sure that we can, that the service can ensure that those species and critical habits aren't jeopardized, we were looking for some additional information to uh, base that decision on. So in that attachment, we're looking for a summary of the listed species that occur within enrolled lands, as well as critical habitats. Uh, the covered activities that are included in your, in your application. If you have that summarized earlier, uh, clearly, that, that would suffice. Again, the geography where your impacts occur, i.e. your enrolled lands. Um, if you have specific notes on which activities are or are not subject to Section 7 review elsewhere, that's helpful for the service to understand where these species might already be considered. And then again, um, in large part, we're looking for the avoidance and minimization measures that are used to, um, you know, used to avoid or minimize impacts, again, to plants or critical habitats. And again, this um, we'll get into de details on this in a separate training, in a separate uh, recording here. Um, so I encourage you to check that out if you are interested in learning more about that. Okay, then the next section we have the agreement to participate. So the signature line for the application in which the ap applicant can sign the form here. Again, when that is then returned later on after review by the administrator. The administrator will sign that in returning. And by signing this, you're, you're agreeing to the terms and conditions of the CCA itself. So those are summarized in the section below here. Basically, you're abiding to all the terms of the CCAA, including the implementation and tracking and reporting and monitoring and uh, paying the administrative fee and um, you know, supporting the program overall. That includes providing an implementation plan within one year of the execution date of your certificate of inclusion. So once you're formally brought into the program, you have a year to provide that implementation plan. That'll also be a subject of a separate um, training here at some point. 
You also acknowledge that as a partner, you're responsible for your own compliance with any state and federal laws, um, including um, you know things like Section 106, Section 7, um, those types of uh, federal laws, but also you know, applicable state laws that are apply there. You're committing to implementing those conservation measures with which you selected in that first full calendar year. And uh, you can propose an alternate sort of ramp up period timeline for implementation if uh, you don't think you can achieve your full adoption, adopted acres target in your first full year. Um, we look for that information here further on in the application. Uh, you're committing to achieving those targets um, on an annual basis. Uh, so it's not just uh, once you achieve your adoption rate, you're done. You're uh, expected through the CCA to achieve those on an annual basis. Uh, track where those occur. Uh, monitor a subset of locations on adopted acres where those occur. Uh, provide the service and administrator um, access if requested to uh, adopted acres or enrolled lands to verify conditions. And then, um, again, sharing the monitoring information that's provided um, with the service or others upon request, um, barring, again, the confidential or business-sensitive information. A common question we'll get to is uh, whether a digital or electronic signature is acceptable for the application form, uh, and that certainly is. So we, we do not need a wet signature. Um, if you provide just a digital signature, um, that should be sufficient. Great. Thanks, Iris. Okay, next then we get into the adopted acres contribution. So this is where we are looking for you to calculate and demonstrate um, your organization's ability to meet the adoption rate that is um, required by the CCAA by those particular sectors. So we do have a nested Excel table within the application itself, which you're welcome to use. You can plug in some basic information regarding your system, um, the miles of your right-of-way, the feet, of you know, sort of the average width of that right-of-way, or if you know the parcel acreage, you could plug that in as an alternative or some combination thereof. That will allow you to calculate your enrolled lands acreage as well as the adopted acres um, that sort of correspond to that based on the adoption rates. I know some partners like working through those numbers themselves, or they might have information in a variety of formats that uh, make this type of calculator not necessarily the preferred method. So if you would like to provide your own calculation, you are more than welcome to do that. Um, we recommend that you can either just replace this out of the application or provide it below in this narrative expl explanation of the calculation. Um, as we've um, described to numerous applicants before, the, the key point here is to show your work. Show us how you got to those numbers uh, from your enrolled lands, uh, how that was estimated, and then what were the adoption rates used to get to that adopted acres target? Um, that's one area I know we've seen in applications where sometimes those calculations aren't clear on that or uh, perhaps are maybe even miscalculated. And so that is a, a key compliance aspect of the agreement is achieving our adopted acres target. So we want to make sure that those numbers are accurate and clearly described. Okay, after you have your number, as was described in the acknowledgements, your, we want to know your proposed implementation schedule. There's sort of a baseline assumption that for most applicants, they'll be able to achieve those adopted acres targets in that first year of enrollment. Um, but of course, depending on the time of your year enrolling, or um, again, you might have a larger organization that requires some time to sort of ramp up into full implementation, the CCAA, allows you flexibility to ramp up your to full implementation uh, over a period of several years, but no longer than five years. And so this is the spot in your application where you can set what that schedule looks like, as well as what are those interim adopted acres targets that you, you believe your organization can achieve over that period to achieve that ramp up. So if you are looking to have that extended period, we ask you to define your own interim targets and those are the targets that um, UIC will confirm that you're achieving in the interim while you're ramping up. And I would just add that those will be considered compliance targets. So when you're defining those, 
um, those interim goals to ramp up to your full adopted acres. Um, just make sure that you're selecting interim targets that you feel confident that you can meet. Great point. Thank you, Iris. Okay, then this next section, we're looking for your monitoring schedule. And again, the, the default here is that uh, partners are monitoring on their adopted acres annually. If you want to know how much you're going to have to monitor on those adopted acres, check out table 14.4 in the CCAA. That tells you the sort of minimum required number of plots based on the amount of adopted acres that you're enrolling. And so uh, those, are, those monitoring plots are required um, annually. We do allow flexibility after the first year, so everybody has to provide those mon that monitoring in their first year of enrollment. Um, but beyond that, if you say you would like to provide monitoring every other year or up to every three years, um, the CCA allows for that flexibility. You still have to provide the number of plots that are required annually. So if you're required to do, let's say, 30 plots a year, um, but you elect to uh, provide monitoring every other year, you have to provide then 60 plots for those two years. So 30 plots for each year um, as part of your monitoring. And so we, we allow that flexibility because we know some partners do have internship programs or research partnerships that are held on basis that are beyond annually. And so we wanted to accommodate those existing programs and provide that flexibility to um, allow alignment with those programs where they are. So again, uh, just detail sort of what that schedule looks like if it's not going to be annually. Okay. So then from there, we get into conservation measures uh, and selecting and describing which conservation measures you plan on implementing. And so again, one of the key aspects of a CCAA is that we're addressing the key threats that are within your control. And so this goes back to, again, what your capabilities are and the constraints are that you described earlier in your application. And when we think about key threats to monarchs, there's the three key threats here that were defined by Fish and Wildlife Service in preparation of the species status assessment. For each of those, we have identified conservation measures that correspond with those key threats. And so the extent that one or more of these key threats apply to your enrolled lands, um, we want you to apply one or more of the conservation measures to those key threats on your adopted acres to, to sort of address those, those threats. And so to do that, we want you to indicate between these two columns, pre and post agreement, um, what types of uh, conservation measures that you're enrolling. So let's say um, many uh, DOTs and power companies routinely do brush removal um, to maintain safety clearances, uh, site clearances, things like that. So that might already be a routine practice. If it is, and you continue to do that as part of a conservation measure, you can continue to note that as routine under post agreement. Um, in other cases, maybe something like using native seeding or planting to restore habitat might not be something that's routinely done. Um, but maybe now as part of post construction restoration work, instead of using a cool season grass or you know fescue mix, maybe now they'll use something like a a mix of native species. And so that becomes a conservation measure where maybe before none of it was occurring, but now it might be occasional, routine. The comparison between these two columns helps us to understand, again, how much of a, a, of a lift this is for your organization, how much of a change is it making. Uh, for some organizations, they might be doing best practices already. And to make that, that switch from pre to post agreement and implementing those conservation measures um, might not be a major change. So you're not required to show so much of a change from one to the other pre post agreement. This is again, just to help give us an understanding of context and the confidence in sort of what measures you're able to implement. And um, you know, again, how routine are those for you to implement and what degree of change is that for you? As it helps pr to provide that context, again, you can add to the comments here describing maybe where that measure applies or again within which context say you know seeding and planting is a good example where that might be limited only to uh, 
uh, post disturbance, site restoration, um, you know, or maybe you have uh, special projects that you'll be implementing. You can note that type of information here. So be sure to review this again for each of those key threats. Uh, address one or more conservation measures to address that um, and note that in here. As you move on then to the next table, there's also the supplemental conservation measures. So these are specifically tied to the um, supplemental measures. So these are practices that don't necessarily contribute to on the ground adopted acres, but these are supplemental measures that are important for pollinator conservation more broadly or for monarch conservation. And so within reductions in your annual administrative fee payment that are required. So for more information on that, I encourage you to check out um, more information on the administrative fee calculator, which we'll be talking about in a separate session as well. So for the supplemental measures, you can see those there. Again, you're not required to necessarily adhere to any of these or check off any of these, but to the extent that you think your organization can and will contribute to supplemental measures, just like the last table, note that here and to what degree you plan on implementing those. Okay, and then that is the information that's required for the application. So you simply provide that information along with the maps and the Section 7 attachment. From here on out, the application form itself is largely uh, reference material for your own purposes. That's there for your own understanding and for your internal uh, organization's coordination and consideration of the agreement. And so that includes definitions. So some of the commonly used definitions or terms that are within the application and certificate of inclusion itself. It also includes a table referencing the conservation measures and their descriptions. So for the, the check boxes that are included in the table that we just reviewed, you can go here to read the details and see some examples of what that means. If you're wondering whether or not the way you might implement something might align with those conservation measures. So I'll scroll through that here. It also contains a similar uh, table describing what those supplemental measures are. So again, if you have questions about what that might entail or examples of that, you can look at that table. And then last, we have a copy of the Certificate of Inclusion within the CCAA. So this is the actual, you know, essentially the contractual document between your organization and UIC. This is the mechanism by which the incidental take coverage is transferred from the um, Enhancement of Survival Permit, of which UIC is the permit holder. You know, that's issued ultimately by Fish and Wildlife Service. And um, this is, again, where your organization is committing to those conservation commitments and receiving in exchange that, that incel take coverage. So I know many organizations have their own procedures and processes for doing contractual review. So we have this example here to help facilitate that and allow you to um, you know, conduct that as appropriate for your own organization. So with that, I guess, Iris, Phil, was there anything on the application you wanted to add? I think you did a great job, Dan, thanks. Um, one just thing I would um, mention, you might have already mentioned it, but just to reiterate, um, as far as the supporting documentation that you provide uh, for the Section 7 information, um, particularly the avoidance and minimization measures, if you can provide that information um, as a Word document, uh, that will also help facilitate the Fish and Wildlife Services review. Um, so I think that's a helpful suggestion. Um, and then also regarding this uh, certificate of inclusion here at the end, again, as Dan said, this is provided more so just for your reference at this stage. Um, at the end of the application review process, uh, we'll circle back um, with an updated version of the certificate of inclusion that would include the final information from your application. Um, and at that point um, is when you would execute the certificate of inclusion. So we've had some questions 
um, from folks as far as do they sign the certificate of inclusion now with the submission of their application? Uh, and the answer is no, wait until uh, the end of the application review process. Phil, is there anything else that, that you would add? Um, no, I think um, maybe for some of the more detailed discussion about the Section 7 information, I'll defer that to, to that presentation. Great. Yep. Um, so, yeah, stay tuned. We'll be doing a number of these tutorials. Uh, so we hope you'll join us for the next one. Thanks.